Hi, my name is Ian, and tonight we're going to talk about what the early Christians believed about the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. The early Christians believed that the book of Genesis was the infallible and absolutely true history of the universe. And furthermore, all other histories in the world either stole from it, copied it, or that they knew from their own memories what the history was. But that Genesis was by no means a composite work um, compiled from other sources. No, it was divinely inspired. Furthermore, they universally believed that it was possible to, within a few hundred years of variation, make a chronology of the entire history of the universe from the dates recorded in the book of Genesis. I have for you tonight 29 different writers, saints, apostles, doctors of the church, martyrs, and laypersons that will back up the claims that I just made. So, if you like the early church and you like the history of Genesis, you found the right video, settle in and we'll proceed with the quotes and a little bit of commentary from me. The first one is St. Barnabas, bishop and martyr, and he is believed to have been one of the 72 that Jesus sent out, and he is going to be relating a common opinion among the early Christians that the six 24-hour days of creation are recapitulated or lived out in the 6,000 years from the creation of the world up through the time of Christ and the early church period. So they all believe that just as Jesus hung on the cross on the sixth day and went through his passion for us, so he also came in the flesh to redeem mankind in the sixth millennia. So one, two, three, four, five, six days, six millennia. He came during the 6,000th year to redeem mankind. And don't take my word for it. You're going to see as the quotes go by. But I just wanted to frame that for you so you can understand what we're going to now read. So here's St. Barnabas from his epistle writing about the year A.D. 90. He writes, The Sabbath is mentioned at the beginning of creation, and God made in six days the work of his hands and made an end on the seventh day and rested on it and sanctified it. Attend my children to the meaning of this expression, he finished in six days. St. Barnabas then goes on to explain the deeper meaning. He continues, This implieth that the Lord will finish all things in six thousand years, for a day is with him a thousand years. And he himself testifieth, saying, Behold, today will be as a thousand years. Therefore, my children, in six days, that is, in six thousand years, all things will be finished. So the second scripture that he there quoted was Psalm 89, verse 4, saying that the day of the Lord is a thousand years. And he's being very clear there when he says, Therefore, my children, in six days, that is, in six thousand years, all things will be finished. So, because all things have not been finished yet, he believes that Christ came during the sixth day, so that would be after the year 5,000. And he's still in that, so according to St. Barnabas, the age of the universe and creation would have to be between 5,000 B.C., and 5,900 B.C. The next father we're going to quote 
is Saint Justin Martyr. And this is from his first apology. Is, so it's written to pagans. And he writes this. And he, speaking of Christ, was predicted before he appeared. First, 5,000 years before, and again, 3,000, then 2,000, then 1,000, and again, 800. For in the succession of generations, prophets after prophets arose, end quote. So he is laying down different times that Jesus was prophesied. 800 years would be what we think of as the book of the prophets, Isaiah, and the uh, 12 minor prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. A thousand years before would be the Psalms of David and the prophecies from that time period. 2,000 years before would be about the time that Abraham offered Isaac. 3,000 years before would be the events around the flood and the prophecies to Noah afterward. Then 5,000 years before would be Genesis 3.15, where the seed of the woman was prophesied to crush the serpent's head. So Justin Martyr here is saying that the date of creation is about 5,000 B.C. Now, I'm assuming that Justin Martyr is throwing out some pretty round dates here. So he may think it's you know 5,000 500 or something like that, uh, 5,200 B.C., we just don't know. Or he may have well meant exactly 5,000 B.C., but it does seem to me like he's saying round numbers, but his numbers are definitely right in the neighborhood with everyone else's. But if that is a true date, then he would be the earliest. All right, the next quote we have from St. Justin Martyr is his, from his Horatory Address to the Greeks. And um, he's, he's establishing here that Moses is the one infallible source of history and that he was greatly plagiarized by the Greeks, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, and all the other writers from that time period. He writes, And from what source did Plato draw the information that time was created along with the heavens. Had he not learned this from the divine history of Moses? Since then, the first day which was created along with the heavens constituted the beginning of all time. For thus Moses wrote, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then immediately subjoins, and one day was made. So he's saying uh, at the beginning, and from what source did Plato draw the information that time was created along with the heavens? Had he not learned this from the divine history of Moses? So St. Justin Martyr is here arguing with Greeks, and he's making the case to them that they stole their wisdom from Moses. And that was the common belief. Uh, the next writing we have here is from uh, his uh, dialogue with Trypho the Jew. So he's discussing now with a Jew the, uh, the uh, prophecies and the Bible that point to the Catholic Church being the fulfillment uh, in Christ of all that the Bible taught. And <clears throat> he writes... But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in what day soever thou shalt eat of it, thou shalt die the death. For as Adam was told, in the day he ate of the tree, he would die. We know that he did not complete a thousand years. We have perceived, moreover, that the expression... The day of the Lord is as a thousand years, is connected with this subject. So, God in Genesis promised Adam and Eve that when they ate of the tree, if they ate of it, they would die in that day. And we know that he lived to be 930 years old. And so, 
Justin here is pointing out as a point of agreement with the Jew that we know that the day of the Lord is as a thousand years. And that's how that was fulfilled. He died spiritually on the day that he ate the fruit, on the literal day, and then died physically during the thousand years, which is one creation day. Okay, the next early Christian we have is St. Theophilus of Antioch. St. Theophilus was a bishop and an apologist, and we have uh, preserved his book to Autolycus, which was his friend, who was a pagan, and who he was trying to convert. In fact, he, he wrote him three small books, uh, and so it's considered to be an apologetic work, and this is what he writes to his friend to convert him. On the fourth day, the luminaries were made, because God, who possesses foreknowledge, knew the follies of the vain philosophers, that they were going to say that the things which grow on earth are produced from the heavenly bodies, so as to exclude God. So these are the type of arguments that philosophers made then and now of, well, you can't believe what's written in the book of Genesis because obviously if there was no sun, there couldn't be life on the planet. Uh, but Theophilus says that God foreknew that men would foolishly deny that plants could even exist before the sun. And he's, he's arguing that that shows their foolishness for not having the faith in God. Uh, he goes on to say, In order, therefore, that the truth might be obvious, the plants and seeds were produced prior to the heavenly bodies. For what is posterior cannot produce that which is prior. So St. Theophilus seems to be saying that God made plants to grow on the day before the sun was created in order to confound the faithless. A uh, little later on in his book, he uh, confirms that Moses is older. His writings are older than all the pagan literature. He writes, Hence, one can see how our sacred writings are shown to be more ancient and true than those of the Greeks and Egyptians or any other historians. For my purpose is not to furnish mere matter of much talk, but to throw light upon the number of years from the foundation of the world. Being indeed created, it is also governed by the providence of God, who made all things, and the whole course of time and the years are made plain to those who wish to obey the truth. So St. Theophilus here says that the age of creation is, quote, made plain to those who wish to obey the truth. St. Theophilus is making the belief in Genesis in the Genesis history, an issue of being willing to obey the truth. And he goes on to say, and to condemn the empty labor and trifling of these authors, because there have been neither 20,000 times 10,000 years from the flood to the present time, as Plato says, affirming that there had been so many years, nor is there a spontaneous production of all things, as Pythagoras and the rest dreamed. So 20,000 times 10,000 is 200 million years. So the fathers rejected the idea of million years and of evolution, which is spontaneous production of all things, um, which were believed to be true in many of the cultures from which uh, they were converting to become Catholic. The early Christians came from all cultures and, and they held these beliefs. And the church from the beginning had a unanimous stance rejecting all of these things as false. Uh, St. The Theophilus specifically says that it is his goal to condemn both the belief in millions of years and of evolution. 
So during the process of this apologetic work, he does trace uh, the entirety of human history, giving dates um, from the Bible as he goes. And when he wraps all of that up, he says, and from the government of Cyrus to the death of the Emperor Aurelius Varius, 744 years. All the years from the creation of the world amount to a total of 5,698 years and the odd months and days. So he's bringing it up to Emperor Aurelius Varius, which was, I believe, just had died just right before he wrote this work. And that would have been that the death of that emperor was in the year 169 AD. So if you do the math, you can see that St. Theophilus of Antioch says that the date of creation is 5,529 BC. Our next writer that we're going to discuss is St. Irenaeus of Lyon, bishop and martyr. This is from his book Against Heresies. He writes, For in as many days as this world was made, in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. And for this reason the scripture says, Thus the heaven and earth were finished, and all their adornment, and God brought to a conclusion upon the sixth day the works that he had made. And God rested upon the seventh day from all his works. So St. Irenaeus seems to be saying that the reason Genesis 2, 1 through 2 is written is to teach us that the six days of creation are recapitulated as the 6,000 years up to the time of Christ in the church. He continues, this is an account of the things formerly created, as also it is a prophecy of what is to come. For the day of the Lord is as a thousand years, and in six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the six thousandth year. So St. Irenaeus is writing towards the end of the second century, so he believed that he was still in the sixth day. So therefore, St. Irenaeus would be saying that the date of creation would be sometime between 5000 and 5800 BC. Our fifth writer is St. Clement of Alexandria. And this is from his 21st chapter, uh, the first book of the Stromata. And this is a very detailed and lengthy analysis of world history uh, like so many of the other fathers will be quoting tonight they use the book of Genesis as their reference point but they also bring in many um, of the chronologies of the cultures around them he brings in the Egyptians the Greeks the Babylonians and he accuses them all of plagiarizing the truth that they know from uh, Moses and the Hebrews. He writes, On the plagiarizing of the dogmas of the philosophers from the Hebrews, we shall treat, by which the philosophy of the Hebrews will be demonstrated beyond all contradiction to be the most ancient of all wisdom. And it makes sense. If it is the truth that goes back to the very beginning, no one else could be more ancient. Uh, he goes on towards the end of that 21st chapter in his chronology that he does there. And he concludes almost at the end by saying, And from Adam to the death of Commodus, 5,784 years, 2 months, and 12 days. So St. Clement of Alexandria is bold to calculate the date of the universe down to the day. Uh, the emperor that he was referencing, Commodus, died in the year 192. So if you do the math, Clement of Alexandria says that the date of creation 
is 5,592 B.C. Uh, St. Clement of Alexandria here gives the oldest date for creation that I am aware of from any saint. The next saint, number six, is St. Hippolytus of Rome. He's a martyr. He writes around the year 200 A.D. And he writes, For as the times are noted from the foundation of the world and reckoned from Adam, they set clearly before us the manner with which our inquiry deals. For the first appearance of our Lord in the flesh took place in Bethlehem under Augustus in the year 5,500, and he suffered in the 33rd year. So it's just a point-blank statement by St. Hippolytus that the date of creation is 5,000. 500 BC. He goes on later and writes, and 6,000 years must needs be accomplished in order that the Sabbath may come. For the Sabbath is the type and emblem of the future kingdom of the saints when they shall reign with Christ. For a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Since then, in six days, God made all things, it follows that 6,000 years must be fulfilled. So he's tying it back to the six days of creation, being the same thing as 6,000 years, but we don't have to guess uh, and give him a date range because we saw he, at, in fact, about three times in that particular work, throws out the exact date of 5,500 B.C., the seventh writer we're quoting from is Julianus Africanus. He's a historian. This is from his uh, chron chronography. Uh, Julianus Africanus was very well-traveled, well-educated man. He actually had correspondence with Origen of Alexandria that we still have. Uh, he writes around the year 221 AD the following. For the Jews, with the truth by the spirit of Moses have handed down to us by their existent Hebrew histories the number of 5,500 years as the period up to the advent of the word of salvation that was announced to the world in the time of the sway of the Caesars. So Julianus Africanus says that creation is dated at 5,500 B.C. And Julia Africanus says that in his time, uh, 221 A.D., the current Hebrew scripture lists a chronology of 5,500 years. So he's just giving the number that's currently in the Hebrew uh, scriptures. This means that the Hebrew Bibles of his day, at least the ones he was aware of, had a Septuagint type of timeline. Uh, the Hebrew text of today would put creation at around the year 4000 BC. Josephus, who was a Jew, writing around the year AD 90, using Hebrew scriptures, had a similar uh, date of creation. He put it at 5467 BC. And Julianus Africanus is also saying that this is the time received and accepted by the church uh, from the original converts from Judaism. Our next writer, number eight, is Origen of Alexandria. This is from his book, First Principles. Around the year 225 AD, he writes, And now, since there is one of the articles of the church, which is held principally in consequence of our belief in the truth of our sacred history, that the world was created and took its beginning at a certain time, and that, agreeably to our belief in Scripture, we can calculate the years of its past duration. So he's saying that uh, the Latin there is basically saying that it's an ecclesiastical definition and he should know he had been corrected and censured many times. He was a 
kind of a problem child for the clergy there in Alexandria because he would say a lot of outlandish things. And a lot of times when he would say or write outlandish things, he would say, well, this is just my opinion. But he's not saying that here. He's saying that there is one of the articles of the church, and it is held because we believe in the truth of our histories, i.e. the Bible, that we can calculate the exact time and duration of creation. And we've seen that already said by other fathers, and we will continue, continue to hear that said. Uh, later, in his work against Celsus, who was a pagan critic who wrote a book attacking uh, the beliefs of Christians, and this is his work countering back to him, he writes the following, and this is around the year 248. After these statements, Celsus, from a secret desire to cast discredit upon the Mosaic account of creation, which teaches that the world is not yet 10,000 years old, but very much under that. So origin of Alexandria in the third century is saying that the world is very much under 10,000 years old. All right, our ninth saint that we're quoting from here is Saint Cyprian of Carthage. He's a bishop and a martyr. We just have a very brief statement from him, but it falls right in line with everything else that people are saying about the day-age view. He says, as the first seven days in the divine arrangement contained 7,000 years. So Saint Cyprian, again, is saying that the seventh day when it comes will be 7,000 years and the common belief was that they're in the sixth day so Saint Cyprian would then believe that the date of creation is somewhere between 5,000 and 5,750 BC. All right, writer number 10 is Saint Victorinus of Petau uh, is a town in what is now northwestern Slovenia he is a bishop and a martyr. This is from his work on the creation of the world. He writes, To me, as I meditate and consider in my mind the creation of this world in which we are kept enclosed, even such is the rapidity of that creation, as is contained in the book of Moses, which he wrote about its creation, and which is called Genesis. God produced that entire mass for the endowment of his majesty in six days. In the beginning, God made the light and divided it in the exact measure of 12 hours by day and by night. So, there's a very clear statement that we had six days for creation and that those six days were the same length of time as days are now, 12-hour days and 12-hour nights. Uh, he goes on in the same work to write, that that true and just Sabbath should be observed in the seventh millenary of years. Wherefore, to those seven days the Lord attributed to each a thousand years. For thus went the warning, in thy eyes, O Lord, a thousand years are as one day. Wherefore, as I have narrated, that true Sabbath will be in the seventh millenary of years when Christ with his elect shall reign. So St. Victorinus then would believe that the date of creation was sometime between 5000 BC and 5700 BC. And he's very clear that he believes that the days of creation are understood as a 1,000 year period each. And he also is very clear that the days of creation are literal 24 hour days. On to number 11 is Saint Methodius of Olympus, bishop and martyr. This is from his work, The Banquet of the Ten Virgins. It's written around the year 290 AD. And after uh, referring to the scriptural account 
of the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, as actual history in the preceding paragraph, St. Methodius goes on to say, For it is a dangerous thing to wholly despise the literal meaning, as has been said, and especially of Genesis, where the unchangeable decrees of God for the constitution of the universe are set forth. So I believe the context of this would be fair to say is that St. Methodius' work is a whole bunch of allegory. But he takes time in a couple of places in the work to work on the theme of because we have an allegory doesn't mean the literal meaning is thrown out in the Bible. And he says here in the, one, the quote we just read that that's especially true in the book of Genesis. A little further on in the same work, he writes, For since in six days God made the heaven and the earth, and finished the whole world, and rested on the seventh day from all his works, which he had made, and blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, which signifies that when this world shall be terminated at the seven thousandth year, when God shall have completed the world, he shall rejoice in us. So again, it's that primitive day-age view that there's six literal days equals six literal millennia. <clears throat> or in this case, he's talking about the seven. Uh, so we can extrapolate then if Christ came on the sixth day, that St. Methodius says that the date of creation is sometime between 5000 BC and 5700 BC. Number 12 is Saint Peter of Alexandria, bishop and martyr. Uh, Saint Peter of Alexandria, like Saint Methodius that we read right before, uh, were both martyred during the Diocletian persecution. And Saint Peter of Alexandria is said to have mentored the young Saint Ath Athanasius of Alexandria. He writes in the year 306, he writes, on that day, indeed, on which God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Whence it is manifest that man was not formed by a conjunction of the body with a certain preexistent type. So again, the idea of a pre-existent type that we would see today with theistic evolution, apparently those concepts were about around back in the early church, and uh, this saint, he's here rejecting any such idea. All right, number 13 is Lactantius. He is a Christian apologist. This is from his work, The Divine Institutes. And he's writing this around the year 315. He writes, Therefore, since all the works of God were completed in six days, the world must continue in its present state throughout six ages, that is, six thousand years. Wherefore, let the philosophers who numerate thousands of ages from the beginning of the world know that the six thousandth year is not yet completed. So two points I want to make from that. Uh, Lactantius saying that the 6,000 year is not yet completed, which is what we assume with all the day-age fathers. And so he's saying that the for him, the date of creation would be sometime between 5,000 and 5,685 BC. The second point that I'd like to make is that for Lactantius and for all these fathers, an age is a millennium, so it's a thousand years. And he's saying that he's refuting these philosophers who believe in thousands of ages. Well, a thousand times a thousand is a million, and they're believing in thousands, so plural, so millions of ages, or th uh, excuse me, thousands of ages would be millions of years. So Lactantius is correcting the false belief in the existence 
of millions of years. All right, we have number 14, Eusebius of Caesarea. He is most famous for his work, uh, the ecclesiastical history, and also for his uh, biography of Constantine the Great. But before he wrote those works, he wrote a chronicle that used the Bible and pagan histories to make a history of the world. And I will give you some quotes from that. He writes, Permit me, right at the outset, to caution everyone against believing that there can be complete accuracy with respect to chronology. Despite this, to the extent that it is possible, use clarity to recognize the nature of the investigation which confronts you and then proceed resolutely. So we see this great historian, Eusebius, being very humble and saying that you can't expect to have a completely spot-on chronology. Uh, there are a number of textual variants. There are also uh, different ways to crunch the numbers that are given in some parts of the Bible. And he's very humbly saying, I'm just going to go ahead and proceed here and do the best I can. A number of the saints uh, that made chronologies do admit this, and they didn't see that as any reason to lose faith in the Bible or to fight with one another. They all just did the best they could. Uh, his next quote from the same work is as follows. Thus, it is patently clear that the Septuagint was translated from old and accurate Hebrew copies and is the most appropriate text for us to use in our present chronicle especially since the Church of Christ, which has spread throughout the world, supports only this version, and since the apostles and disciples of Christ used and transmitted this version. End quote. So, um, the understanding and text handed down to the Catholic Church from the apostles is the Septuagint, which... Eusebius believes to be the most faithful translation of the Hebrew text. Eusebius wraps up his run through history and gives us his date. Uh, he writes, From Adam until the second year of Darius is 4,680 years. From the second year of Darius until the 15th year of Tiberius is 548 years. Thus, from Adam until the 15th year of Tiberius, a total of 5,288 years elapsed. And the 15th year of Tiberius is mentioned in Luke 3.1 when John the Baptist starts to preach. So Eusebius of Caesarea says that the date of creation is 5,199 B.C. Uh, he is the shortest age of creation given by any father, uh, presuming, of course, that Justin Martyr's date of 5,000 years was just a rough, rough number and not intended to be exact. Number 15, Firmicus Maternus. He was a layman. He was converted Roman astrology expert. He'd authored a famous eight-volume set on astrology that was uh, famous then and is still talked about today. In about the year 346, he writes, For after long ages, in the last reaches of time, that is, almost at the end of the week of the centuries, the Word of God commingled himself with human flesh, to save mankind, to conquer death, to link the frailty of the human body with divine immortality. So Formicius Maternus seems to be saying that the date of creation is somewhere between 5000 and 5650 BC. Saint Hilary of Poitiers is number 16, bishop 
and doctor of the church. He's often referred to as the Athanasius of the West because of his opposition to the Arian heresy. The following quote was written around the year 355 AD and it is from St. Hilary's commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. It is the oldest existent Latin commentary on Matthew. Uh, he writes, After six days, Peter, James, and John were taken apart from the others and brought to the top of a mountain. As they were looking on, the Lord was transfigured and resplendent in all brilliance of his garments. In this manner, there is preserved an underlying principle, a number, and an example. It was after six days that the Lord was shown in his glory by his clothing. That is, the honor of the heavenly kingdom is prefigured in the unfolding of 6,000 years. So he's making an indirect reference to the teaching of the six days of creation being recapitulated in the 6,000 years this shows us that not only did he believe in the teaching, but that it was a common enough belief that the people that would be reading his commentary would also understand what he was talking about without any explanation. He goes on to write in a different part of the book on Matthew 20, verse 6, the following, At the eleventh hour, the Lord shows the time of his advent in the body, his birth from Mary, which had been determined to take place during the present age out of all ages, pertains to that eleventh hour of the day. In fact, when one divides all six thousand years by the number five hundred, the time of his birth in the flesh is computed according to the accounting of the whole divided by elevens. So, <clears throat> I wonder if maybe that couldn't have been translated a little better. I don't know. But what he seems to be saying is this is the parable of the different workers that get called out at different parts of the day. And that he's saying, as many fathers do say, the Christians were the final dispensation. We're the ones that got called in the eleventh hour. And if you do the math, then you can see that 6,000 divided by 12, excuse me, 6,000 divided by 500 equals 12. And so 11 periods of 500, because each one of the 500s would equal one hour of the workday. Uh, that would give you 5,500 BC as the time when Christ came in the flesh to hire us 11th hour employees. So St. Hilary is presupposing that his readers believe the date of creation is 5,500 and that they understand the creation day millennia connection. And Jesus coming in the sixth millennia was such a normative concept that St. Hilary could bring out these apparently unique allegorical interpretations with very little explanation. Number 17, Saint Athanasius of Alexandria, bishop and doctor of the church. This is from his second discourse against the Arians. It's written about the year 358 AD. He writes, For as to the separate stars, or the great lights, not this appeared first and that second, but in one day, and by the same command, they were all called into being. And such was the original formation of the quadrupeds, and of the birds and fishes, and cattle and plants. Thus, too, has the race made after God's image come to be, namely men. For though Adam only was formed out of the earth, yet in him was involved the succession of the whole race. So he's saying here that the sun and the stars were all made at the same time. 
one in the same time. We didn't have some that are older than others. And also, uh, I thought it was interesting that we'd heard that quote from above from his spiritual father, Peter of Alexandria, who was rejecting that Adam was formed from a pre-existent humanoid type. And he's also making the point here that Adam was the only person formed and everyone else came from him. Uh, the next father we have, number 18, is St. Basil the Great, bishop and doctor of the church. This is from his Hexameron, which was nine homilies preached on the six days of creation and then later edited into a very famous and highly regarded book. It's around the year 368, and he writes, Under the form of history, the law is laid down for what is to follow. Now 24 hours fill up the space of one day. We mean of a day and a night. Thus, every time that, in the revolution of the sun, evening and morning occupy the world, their periodical succession never exceeds the space of one day. So, once again, we have a father just making it real clear. When we talk about the days of creation, we're talking about one day. And because he's talking about the revolution of the sun, you might think, well, he's probably talking the days after the sun was created. And that would be a fair assessment, just taking that quote by itself. But he's actually discussing this specifically about the first day of creation because he's saying, well, without the sun, how would we know how long that day is? And then he's clarifying, saying the amount of time that it takes for the sun to make one complete rotation, 24 hours, that's how long the day is. Uh, he goes on, the water had been gathered into the reservoir assigned to it. The earth displayed its productions. It had caused many kinds of herbs to germinate, and it was adorned with all kinds of plants. He continues, However, the sun and the moon did not yet exist, in order that those who live in ignorance of God may not consider the sun as the origin and the father of light, or the maker of all that grows out of the earth. That is why there was a fourth day, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. So St. Basil seems to be saying that those who believe that the sun is needed for life on earth are ignorant of God. And I believe that he would likewise say that those who would find the six-day account of creation uh, impossible and therefore rule it out, he would likely condemn them as well. Uh, this is very much the same statement that we heard earlier from St. Theophilus of Antioch. Later in the ninth homily, he makes some similarly strong statements. It's written that he said the following, There are those truly who do not admit the common sense of the scriptures, for whom water is not water, but some other nature, who see in a plant, in a fish, what their fancy wishes, who change the nature of reptiles and wild beasts to suit their own ends. For me, grass is grass, plant, fish, wild beast, domestic animal, I take all in the literal sense. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Shall I then prefer foolish wisdom to the oracles of the Holy Spirit? So, apparently, for St. Basil to reject the literal sense of Genesis 1 through 3 is to be ashamed of the gospel. He goes on and says, It is this which those seem to me not to have understood who, giving themselves up to the distorted meaning of allegory, have undertaken to give a majesty of their own invention to Scripture. It is to believe themselves wiser than the Holy Spirit, 
and to bring forth their own ideas under the pretext of exegesis. Let us hear the scripture as it has been written. So, St. Basil is definitely very condemnatory towards people who would say that the Bible is not intended to convey a true history. Number 19 is St. Ephraim the Syrian. He is a poet and his work has been heavily retained in some of the Eastern liturgies. And this is from his commentary on Genesis. This is the opening paragraph. He writes, No one should think that the creation of six days is an allegory. It is likewise impermissible to say that what seems, according to the account, to have been created in six days was created in a single instant. And likewise, that certain names presented in this account either signify nothing or signify something else. On the contrary, we must know that just as the heaven and the earth, which were created in the beginning, are actually the heaven and the earth, and not something else understood under the names of heaven and earth, so also everything else that is spoken of as being created and brought into order after the creation of heaven and earth is not empty names, but the very essence of the created natures corresponds to the force of these names. So, St. Ephraim is very clear that one must believe the Bible as it's put forward in Genesis. We're not to allegorize it. We're not to come up with our own interpretations. It means what it says, and it is true. He continues talking, in this case, about the length of the days of creation. He writes, In it the number of hours of day and night were equal. The light remained a length of twelve hours, so that each day might also obtain its own hours, just as the darkness had obtained a measured length of time. Although the light and the clouds were created in the twinkling of an eye, the day and the night of the first day were each completed in twelve hours. Number 20, St. Aphanius of Salamis, Bishop. He wrote a three-book set called the Panarion, which was a category of all known heresies, and he starts with the beginning of creation, talks about errors about God all the way up to the time of the people of God, and then most of the book are heresies from the time of Christ up to his date, and he was writing around the year 375. So the first part of the book, he does not give us a complete list of all the years uh, of the world, but he gives enough of the dates that we can get a pretty good idea where he'd come out as far as a chronology. So uh, let me read you uh, the two that I think really demonstrate the point. He writes, So eight human beings were preserved from the waters of the flood in the ark of those days, and thus a tenth generation had passed, making 2,262 years. And then a little further down, he writes, On reaching the age of 99, this patriarch, Abraham, was given the commandment of circumcision by God, and the character of Judaism originated from this. And it was the 21st generation, 3,431 years after the foundation of the world. So I believe that this 3,431 year date for the circumcision of Isaac uh, is the last date given by St. Aphanius. <clears throat> but from that, he's definitely at the high end of the textual variance, and it firmly puts him into the 5,500 B.C. camp or something close to it. 
Number 21 is C. Gregory of Nazianzus, Bishop and Doctor of the Church. He's been given the title of the Theologian by the Church. He's the only person to have gotten that title. This is written around the year 381, and he's speaking of St. Basil. I will only say this of him. Whenever I handle his hexameron and take its words on my lips, I am brought into the presence of the Creator and understand the words of creation and admire the Creator more than before, using my teacher as my only means of sight. So St. Gregory of Nazianzus viewed St. Basil as his teacher in many areas, including on Genesis. He's saying that the work that we quoted from earlier, where he stated that the creation days were 24 hours and that he so strongly condemned those who try to allegorize under the pretext of exegesis the meanings, the literal meanings of Genesis away. He was so condemnatory. Uh, St. Gregory of Nazianzus is here saying that to him, that's his only means of sight in when he's interpreting Genesis is that work. So it's a very, very high words from a very highly esteemed father. Number 22, St. Gregory of Nyssa. He wrote a book on the six days of Genesis. This is, both these two quotes are from that. It's around the year 385 that he wrote. And the first one is, again, another uh, high praise for St. Basil's hexameron. He writes, Before I begin, let me testify that there is nothing contradictory in what the saintly Basil wrote about the creation of the world, since no further explanation is needed. They should suffice and alone take second place to the divinely inspired testament. And he's saying this because he's covering basically the same part of the Bible that St. Basil's work covered, but he goes into slightly different questions in his work. And so he's saying, I, I'm not going to cover everything. There's no need to. St. Basil already said it. And his commentary on the six days of creation is second only to the Bible itself. And then the other quote uh, we'll look at is from the same work, and he writes this, O man of God, we respond to your intelligent question and transfer nothing of our written report into figurative allegory, nor do we leave unexplored any objection brought to our attention. So St. Gregory is just stating there that he's not going to try to dodge stuff and run off into allegory. He's going to answer the questions that are being posed in the work in a straightforward manner. Okay, number 23, St. Ambrose of Milan. In his discussion of the first day of creation, he discusses different ways that the word day can be used in scripture. St. Ambrose then specifically uh, defines the creation day as 24 hours. And this is around the year 389. He writes, But scripture established a law that 24 hours, including both day and night, should be given the name of a day only. As if one were to say, the length of one day is 24 hours in extent. The night's in this reckoning are considered to be component parts of the days that are counted. So pretty straightforward. He's giving a definition. And uh, this was a series of sermons that he preached on the creation narrative. And he preached them during Holy Week. And it is said that St. Augustine was waiting to be baptized. And among the faithful that heard these homilies preached, during this Holy Week, just before his baptism. Okay, the next person we have, number 24, is Tychonius of Carthage. Sadly, uh, Tychonius was a Donatist schismatic. Uh, however, his work was quoted by St. Augustine 
and St. Augustine recommended for people studying scripture uh, to read his work with, of course, due discretion because of his heretical leanings. Um, Tyconius of Carthage writes around the year 400 saying, for just as God worked this world for six days, so he works the spiritual world, which is the church, for 6,000 years. And he is going to stop on the seventh day, which he has blessed and made eternal. So Tyconius of Carthage holds to the common understanding that uh, Christ came in the sixth millennia and that there will be some kind of change at the end of that millennia. And so that means that he would believe that the date of creation is sometime between 5,000 and 5,600 B.C. Number 25, St. Jerome, Bishop and Doctor of the Church. This is from his Chronicon or Temporum Liber. It's written about the year 380. He writes, There are altogether from Adam until the 14th year of Valens, that is, until his sixth consulate and the second of Valentinian, 5,579 years. So the 14th year of Valens was 378 AD. So St. Jerome, in his chronology, places the date of creation at 5,201 B.C. And about 38 years later, St. Jerome writes a letter, and it, he says the following, A thousand years in thy sight are as yesterday. From this passage and from the epistle, which is attributed to the Apostle Peter, I conclude that the custom comes of taking a thousand years for one day, with the result, that is, that just as the universe was fashioned in six days, so one believes that it will last only 6,000 years, and afterwards will come the sevenfold and the eightfold number, when the true Sabbath will be kept and the purity of the circumcision will be restored. At the time of this writing, St. Jerome would have held that the creation was 5,619 years old, Thus, he would have seen his time as still being in the sixth day. Okay, our next saint is number 26, St. Gaudentius of Bresca. Bresca is a city in the region of Lombardy, North Italy. Uh, St. Gaudentius was consecrated by St. Ambrose, knew Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, and was a friend of St. John Chrysostom. And he writing, he's writing this about the year 405. He writes, We wait for that truly holy day of the 7,000th year, which will follow those six days, that is, the 6,000 years. So again, St. Gaudentius held to the common belief that the six days of creation were recapitulated in 6,000 years, and that Christ came in the sixth millennia. And so that would mean that St. Gaudentius would believe that the date of creation was sometime between 5,000 and 5,600 B.C. Number 27, Sulpicius Servus. He's a writer and a historian. And this is from his Sacred History. Written around the year 403, he writes, The world was created by God nearly 6,000 years ago, as we shall set forth in the course of this book, although those who have entered upon and published a calculation of these dates but little agree among themselves. As, however, this disagreement is due either to the will of God or to the fault of antiquity, it ought not be a matter of censure. Uh, so, uh, so Picius service goes on and lists dates of creation that add up to 5,496 BC. So he's, he's right in the ballpark with everyone else. And the differences between him 
and Eusebius, who also does a similar chronology, the Office of Antioch, they're all within a couple hundred years of each other. So we're not talking millions or billions of years of difference. He's saying that they're they're not going to agree exactly, but it's it's either the will of God or the fault of antiquity. It's nothing to be worried about. All right, number 28, St. Augustine. St. Augustine of Hippo is a bishop and a doctor of the church. Although St. Augustine uh, writes many, many statements that show the early Christian belief and his personal belief that the Bible is true history and that um, we can calculate the age of the earth in many of his works. I'm just going to confine myself today just because of the sheer volume of his writing just to the city of God. The city of God is written in 426 AD and the first quote is they are deceived too by those highly mendacious documents which profess to give the history of many thousand years. Though reckoning by the sacred writings, we find that not six thousand years have passed. So like Origen and many of the other saints that have gone before, St. Augustine believes that the scripture can be used to calculate the age of creation. He goes on, they would fain oppose the authority of our well-known and divine books, which predicate that the whole world would believe them, and which the whole world accordingly has believed, which proved, too, that it had truly narrated past events by its prediction of future events, which have so exactly come to pass. So he ties it all together. The scriptures show a true past. They predicted that they would be fulfilled and that the world would come to believe in them. And it has so happened. In a, another section, he writes the following. As to those who are always asking why man was not created during these countless ages of the infinite and extended past, and came into being so lately that according to the scriptures less than 6,000 years have elapsed since he began to be. So what he's, he's arguing with here are people that are saying, well, if the world is very ancient, millions of years old, how come God only created man in the last 6,000 years? And Augustine's position is, well, it's not millions of years old, as we've seen, it's 6,000 years old. So he's, he's refuting that position. He goes on to say, It offends them that the time that has elapsed since the creation of man is so short, and his years so few, according to our authorities. Let them take this into consideration, that nothing that has a limit is long and that all the ages of time being finite are very little. He continues, Consequently, if there had elapsed since the creation of man, I do not say five or six, but even sixty or six hundred thousand years, or sixty times as many, or six hundred or six hundred thousand times as many, or this sum multiplied until it could no longer be expressed in numbers, the same question would still be put, why was he not made before? So he's showing that there are people in the world during his time that believe in millions, billions, and infinite number of years, which he rejects. And he's saying that our ancestors are not millions of years old, that Adam and everything else was created and we can, we can tell you when that was. And as we showed above that he believes that the creation is less than 6,000 years old. Here are two separate quotes that I'll put together uh, where he gives definite dates for the chronology of the world. The first is, From Adam to the deluge, there are reckoned, according to our scriptures, 2,262 years. 
And then in the next book, he writes, There are thus, from the flood to Abraham, 1,072 years, according to the Vulgate or Septuagint versions. So St. Augustine here gives a total of 3,334 years from creation to the birth of Abraham. And from various other statements St. Augustine makes in the City of God, books 15 through 17, I believe that it can be shown that Augustine believes that the date of creation is somewhere between 5,350 B.C. and 5,500 B.C. Um, maybe I'll do an update video if I get that ironed out a little better. And then again back to book 15, uh, speaking of the histories in Genesis and other books of the Old Testament, he writes, For what right-minded man will contend that the books so religiously preserved during thousands of years and transmitted by so orderly a succession were written without an object, or that only the bare historical facts are to be considered when we read them. And since this is so, if not even the most audacious will presume to assert that these things were written without a purpose, or that though the events really happened, they mean nothing, or that they did not really happen, but are only an allegory. So I think it's interesting here that he says that not even the most audacious will presume to assert that the things were written without a purpose or that even though the events really happened, they mean nothing. So he's basically saying he doesn't even know of anybody, speaking of Christians, that would say that these histories are not real or that they don't have a meaning that applies to the church. So that tells you that no Christians, zero, it was 100% acceptance of the doctrine that the Genesis histories are true. Uh, he goes on to say, we must rather believe that there was a wise purpose in their being committed to memory and to writing, and that they did happen and have a significance, and that this significance has a prophetic reference to the church. So he's laying out some parameters here, just like a number of the other doctors and saints did before him, that they were committed and passed down carefully for a reason, that what's recorded in there did happen, and it has a significance with a prophetic reference to the church. And St. Augustine is not in fra afraid to take a Christian that has a weird interpretation of stuff, name them by name, set them up at the front of class, put a spotlight on them, and tear them to shreds, personally humiliate them, wreck their arguments, and he'd be more than happy to do that in this case. But he's saying he doesn't know of anybody who disagrees with these things. All right, number 29, last but certainly not least, is Saint Pope Saint Leo the Great, Sermon 27 on the Feast of the Nativity, around the year 460 AD. He's recorded as having said the following, But what is the sun, or what is the moon, but elements of visible creation and material light, one of which is of the greater brightness and the other of the lesser light? For as it is now daytime and now nighttime, so the Creator has constituted diverse kinds of luminaries, although even before they were made, there had been days without the sun and nights without the moon. So His Holiness, Pope St. Leo the Great, taking time uh, leading up to Christmas to remind the faithful, the important truth, that we had days before we had sun, moon, and stars. Well, that is 
the quotes that we have for today, and there are many, many more, but that is a lot. And I think the points are clearly made that I started out with, that Genesis is the one infallible and eternal truth when it comes to the history of the universe. That this was believed by the Jews at the time of Christ, uh, then that was passed on to the church, that it was commonly accepted that the six days of creation were prophetically fulfilled in the 6,000 years which led up to the time of the church and that Christ came in that sixth millennium and that shows you the time frame in addition to the specific dates given that all the Christians believed which is reflected in what they used for their Old Testament at the time the Septuagint and it's around 5,500 years, give or take a few hundred years, is the age of creation at the time of Christ. Um, here are all the, the specific dates given, and then the day age fathers. So that's a lot of saints that give specific days. So let it not be said that the early Christians did not believe that Genesis was intended to be understood as literal history. They all, with one accord, believed that it was. So, <clears throat> whatever you may think of these quotes that I presented or of my commentary that I've inserted, uh, I hope we can all agree, if you are a traditional Catholic, that all of these saints are praying for us to have final perseverance. And if you are not a traditional Catholic, please know that we who are traditional Catholics and all of these saints that we've quoted here today are all praying for you to have the grace of faith to become converted and become a traditional Catholic and join us in the one ark of salvation, apart from which no man shall be saved.